I'm introducing Tamika Butler. Tamika is the executive director of Los Angeles County Bicycle Coalition. And there are a few things um, about Tamika that I think you should know. Um, the first is that uh, Tamika is brave and fearless. And she's comfortable coming into a room like this. And even though we've come a long way, recognizing that the people planning our cities don't always look like our cities. And she does it in a way that allows us to have a conversation about it, um, which I think is so important. Um, the second thing about Tamika is just the high quality and comprehensive nature of her thinking. Tamika and I share um, something in common, which is that we didn't come to this world because we were lifetime bicyclists or hardcore um, cyclists. Uh, we came here because we love bikes, but we love our cities even more. And when Tamika talks about bikes, she's not just talking about bikes. She's talking about equity. She's talking about uh, racial justice. She's talking about housing. She's talking about health. Um, she talks about all of the things that bicyclists and, and, and active transportation really get us to. Um, and the last thing I'll say about Tamika is that um, she is an excellent listener. And I have had the great pleasure of working with a lot of amazing advocates in a lot of different cities. And many of them are in this room and are my personal heroes. And they have great attributes. Good listener is probably not top five. Um, and, you know, uh, with uh, uh, in complete honesty, it's not in my top five either. So uh, it's something that I learned from Tamika um, and watch her and have had such a, such a great time um, working together with her. The last thing that I'll say we share is that Tamika and I are both kind of from the middle of nowhere. Um, Tamika's from Nebraska, I'm from Mississippi, very different. Um, but we both know what it feels like um, to sort of fight your way uh, through a conversation um, when it, it can be very lonely uh, when you're out in the middle of nowhere. So without further ado, Tamika Butler. Good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully you're enjoying your lunch. I hope I still get one, um, but I did enjoy my salad very much. So first, I want to say thank you to Salita, um, one of my heroes, but also has become one of my friends. Um, Salita is amazing, and I think so much a part of what is going right in LA, um, but also she's just like super dope and can talk to you about rap for a very long time. Um, she is... She's a, she's a pro. Um, so um, thank you for that. And then the other, the other person I wanted to take outside of NACTO for just having me and, and really um, taking a chance to have me here and speak is just um, Corinne specifically from NACTO. Um, I have been a hot mess the last few weeks. Like I messed up my travel, I messed up my hotel. I left my computer in LA and flew back to get it because it was cheaper than getting it sent here somehow in my head. Like, I have been a mess. And at every step of the way, she just smiles and she's like, I got it, I got it. And so this, this conference wouldn't be possible without her. And so I just wanna thank, thank you so much, so. So I, I think I, I, don't, I have about 20 minutes, but somebody should probably tell me when I'm getting close um, because I like to talk a lot. Um, the name of, of this presentation, I had to come up with a name for it. Um, and so I called it Planning While Black because why not, I'm black. Um, and I, I like social media a lot. There's gonna be a little bit of, um, of talk of social media throughout but feel free um, to tweet at me. Um, I, I enjoy that quite a bit. So as Salita said, I'm from Nebraska originally. Um, 
This is um, my cousin Joe. Um, I actually don't know who this guy is. I just like, <laughs> who the fuck is that guy? I don't know. But when you Google Nebraska, a lot of um, white folks in front of the good life sign come up because Nebraska, the good life. Um, and I, I left Nebraska because when someone was like, Nebraska, the good life, I again had this face. Um, and you know, as, as a, as a black queer kid who, who gets to Nebraska, my parents both grew up there. They met in high school there. Um, they were semi-high school sweethearts, though my mom was dating someone else, so we don't really ever talk about it. Um, but my dad was in the military, so I grew up everywhere. Um, and, and I really grew up in, in Okinawa, Japan, where I was from second grade to right before high school. And so when, when my dad came home and said we were going to Nebraska, I really didn't know what to make of it. Because in, in Okinawa, when you're on a military base, everyone is American. And there's one store on base. So we literally all have the same jeans, all have the same shirts, all have the same stuff, because that's the only place. And so when I moved back to the States, and, and I had already come out to my parents um, before I left middle school is gay, because when you're as gay as me, you can only hide it for so long. Um, and, and, you know, I knew I was black, because my parents were black, and they told me we were black all the time, mostly in the context of white kids doing stupid shit, and my parents being like, black people don't do that, because you will get beat. Um, and so I, I knew I was black, but it wasn't until I moved back to the United States where it was literally that situation of, you know, all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria. And I couldn't figure out why all the black kids were sitting together in the cafeteria and why everyone wasn't just hanging out together. And so I very um, quickly realized that Nebraska probably wasn't the place for me and that I, I needed to move. Um, and so I went to college there. Um, I really wanted to go to college in New York. I thought being in a big city would be great. I, I got into Columbia and my parents said, that's awesome, we'll just take out another mortgage on the house to be able to afford it. And so I opted to stay in Omaha and go to Creighton where I had a full ride um, with the promise to myself that I would leave immediately after, law, or after um, college and go to law school. Um, so this is, this is a quick break from my story. Um, this is a, this is a white guy I do know, not, not personally, but like, who doesn't know Mark? Um, and so, you know, what I want to say in this short social media break, and I'll have a couple short social media breaks throughout, because I know how these keynotes go. It's someone talking to you while you're trying to eat, and then your phone goes off, or you are tweeting about the talk, and then you get distracted by something else on Twitter, and then you go down this rabbit hole. And so I'll just take these breaks for you, where you can just <laughs> look at your phone, and it won't hurt my feelings, and we can just call it what it is. And then we'll, we'll come back to Mark later. So back to my story. So I decided I'm, I'm black, and I'm gay, and I'm so not Midwestern. I have to go away. So I, I went to Stanford. This is a picture um, with me and my black classmates at Stanford, all of us. Um, and... And you know, I had I had this this experience at Stanford that was that was really really great. Um, you know, I still rocked the crochet braids when they weren't cool. Um, I wore a baseball cap every day, including when I graduated and gave the graduation speech, um, because I felt like it was this place where where I was finally myself and where I finally started to realize um, that I was comfortable going across these barriers where often I was too black for gay spaces and too gay for black spaces. And this group of folks at Stanford, it was, it was a place where I really first started to accept myself in both of those identities at those intersections. But it was also a place where I accepted that I was Midwestern. I was super Midwestern. And that I really miss Nebraska all the time. Um, everything is really expensive in Palo Alto, not so much in Omaha. And so I, you know, I stayed in, in the San Francisco Bay Area for a few years. I practiced law. I was a nonprofit employment lawyer 
at um, at a legal aid office doing civil rights stuff. And then um, and then I met this woman at, at a law conference. This is this is my my wife, Kelly. And this is before she was my wife. Um, and this is a really important picture for me because our, our relationship was was relatively new. Um, but I, I had decided that I hate it being a lawyer because who likes being a lawyer except for <laughs> lawyers, um, including my wife. Um, and, and I decided that I was ready to move and I was in love with her, so I was gonna move to LA. And when I moved to LA, a lot of folks who know me know this about me, I hated it. Um, you know, Kelly loves LA. Um, she's from a long line of Canadians who have left Canada due to the gray weather. She grew up in Phoenix, and then she went to law school in LA and has never left, because the weather's amazing. Sorry, Seattle. Um, and she never wanted to leave. So I moved there for her, but I was in my car all the time. Like, just all the time. In San Francisco, I walked everywhere. I was on public transit all the time. And when I got to LA, I was always in my car. And so I had a friend, um, a friend who also introduced me to Kelly, who said, you should do um, AIDS life cycle with me, and you should ride your bike from, from San Francisco to LA. And I somehow um, was convinced to do that. You'll notice she's not in this picture. She didn't do it. <laughs> um, but she convinced me to do it. And um, it's where I really fell in love with biking. It's where I really fell in love with just being on the road by myself um, I, I'm terrified in this picture because I'm like, wait, what? I'm biking for five days and then I have to camp at night? Who convinced me of this and why isn't she here? Um, and the look on Kelly's face is, uh, oh dear, this might not go well. Um, but I made it through and I, you know, something I started um, because my doctor told me that I was pre-diabetic and I needed to be more fit. Um, fell into something that I was really, really passionate about. And I ultimately ended up at the LA County Bicycle Coalition. And I think, you know, my, my love for biking that started as this hobby has really turned into a profession. Um, you know, I, I met this woman, she was amazing. My dog loved her, there were a lot of dog shout outs, so I thought I'd give Stuart Little some love. Um, he fell in love with her. And so I was like, all right, hipster guy, let's pack up from San Francisco and let's get the U-Haul like all lesbians do. And um, let's move to LA, let's get married. And we did, and I felt like that's, you know, my, my life really started to fall together. Um, so, so here's one of my social media breaks. So when, when you're planning wall black, it's, it's a lot like planning wall white. Um, not at all, but in some ways it's very similar. You work really hard and, and you take these breaks. And this was one of my favorite, favorite breaks I, I ever took on social media. I was just taking a break from work. I was on Facebook and I saw this video come up. Who's ever seen this video? So not that many people. This is a, a video um, from Brooklyn um, and it's this white guy who was a runner, and he was bumped into by another white guy, said polo white guy, um, who was pushing his baby stroller. And it pissed him the fuck off. He was just so angry, so angry in fact, that his white privilege allowed him to get in a cop's face because he wasn't worried at all that anything would happen to him. But he got in this, this guy's face and he said uh, many things, but one of the things he said to him was, I've been in this neighborhood forever. I'm one of the white people who settled this neighborhood so that people like you could live here. And so, again, when you're planning while black and you're just trying to take that like internet break and you're just trying to completely clear your mind and then you see something like this, you get right back to work. Cause you're like, shit, that guy is definitely a cyclist. He's <laughs> definitely, Definitely a cyclist. Like that is who we deal with all the time, right? And what you can't see in this screen grab is that there's black guys who are filming this on their cell phone and they're like, okay, thanks white guy. Thanks for settling the neighborhood for us because they've been in Brooklyn, right? 
And so I think this was one of those times where I just want to take a break. I think so many of us do it and we look at kids' pictures and we look at cute animal videos, but sometimes when you're planning while black, you can't even take a break. Because when you go to just look at funny shit, you're like, but that's real. And that's what we're up against every day when we're trying to make our cities better. So then you get back to work. And so picking up my story from the social media break, I moved to LA. And, and this is when you, Google, when you Google Nebraska, you get white guys in front of the sign. When you Google LA, you get traffic and freeways, right? And so this is what a lot of people think of LA. This is what I thought of LA when I moved there. But LA is so much more than this, right? Like this is, this is one of my pictures from, from my social media. And this was a day that I got up, I did a bike ride, I went to an outdoor pool party, I relaxed in the hot tub, and then I took this picture of the beautiful sunset. Because this is the LA so many of us who live there know. This is the place that is amazing that we wanna make better. And when you live in LA, everybody's happy. It's really hard not to be happy in LA. I mean, he does it in a car. Most people aren't as happy in their cars. But I mean, LA is in a moment. And you heard about that a little earlier today from the panel. The Rams have come home, which for people who don't know is a football team. Um, but the Rams have come home. And our starting quarterback rides his bike to the first day of training camp, right? Like we are, we are in this moment where people are finally starting to talk about more than just cars. And the reality is we've always been there. We've always been talking about more than just cars, but now we're finally starting to get a little bit of recognition. And part of the reason is because we have Salida. And Salida has been awesome. Not only does she look good when she's biking to the Emmys with our homie Marcel and one of the producers of Mad Men. I mean, where else can you do this besides LA? You know, we get, to, we get to have just as much fun in our city as we do work. This was a work day. So when my wife is in her law firm in this tall building in downtown LA and she's like, oh, I'm writing another brief. I'm like, oh my gosh, my day sucks too. I have to go to the Emmys, ugh. <laughs> and that's, that's what we get to do um, in LA. I think the other thing we've talked a lot about at this conference so far is bike share. And bike share being this thing in LA that, yes, has many challenges because LA, as we said this morning, is 88 cities and unincorporated areas. So that means a lot for bike share, which I won't get into. But bike share is also this chance where we're just gonna get more people on bikes. I don't know that they'll all look as fly as us, but they're gonna be on bikes. We also, you know, made sure that we, we joined in this, in this movement to be a Vision Zero City. And being a Vision Zero City, I, I talked on a panel before this, NACTO really, really, really wanted me to go Drake style back to back. So I was like on a panel before this, and, and I talked a little bit about how bike share is just part of this larger puzzle. That includes things like Vision Zero. Because if, if folks don't feel safe getting around, then they're not gonna get on the bike share or any bike for that matter. And I think, you know, for me, I really, really, really focus on enforcement and what that looks like and what that means for low-income folks of color as they are doing Vision Zero work. And I think in LA, we're tackling that question better than a lot of other cities. There's other cities that are doing great work, and I'll talk more about that later. But I do think that we are at this place in LA where we are rich in our diversity, and we're letting that impact all of the decisions we make and all of the planning we do. I don't think it's an accident that when there's a panel this morning and there are two women representing a city, they're from LA. And one of them is a woman of color and her boss is a black man. I don't think that's a mistake. I think we're being intentional to make sure that the folks who are planning our cities look like the folks who make up our cities. We also talked a little bit about this earlier I am allowed to talk about um, ballot measures and there's gonna be on the ballot um, a measure, a traffic improvement plan is what we're calling it. Um, I've gotten in trouble for calling it anything else, but it's a traffic improvement plan. And for us, it's really important because this is part of that puzzle that I was talking about. 
we want people to feel safe. We want people to have fun getting on bikes, but we also want them to feel connected. A lot of folks who know me know the story of when I was living in the Bay and I talked to my wife and her little sister had just moved back to LA after spending a year out of the country. She called me crying because her sister was moving to Santa Monica and she lived in Northeast LA. And she's like, I'm never gonna see her. <laughs> and I'm just like, babe, I don't have time for this. Like, she lives 30 minutes away and she's lived out of the country and you're never going to see her? And then I moved to LA and I'm like, shit, she lives in Santa Monica. I never want to see her. It's so far. And that's what having transportation money is going to do for us. That's part of this moment we're in, right? That people are finally going to be connected. For me, that's the most exciting part, that you're actually going to be able to have deeper, richer relationships in LA because you're not going to be worried about what Google Maps tells you. And then I think the last piece of LA, and I talked a little bit about this with our, our leadership and our government offices, um, whether or not it's Salida or our mayor or anybody who's come up today, um, you know, we have, I think, the most incredible DOT. I could just name people for days. If you don't know Nat, you should meet him. If you don't know Valerie, you should meet her. If you don't know Rubina, you should meet her. Like, we have an awesome team. But I also think we have an awesome team of advocates. I think this is just another example of the fact that the folks doing the work in LA actually reflect the communities in LA. This isn't us saying, yo, we need a white girl, yo, Asian girl, come in the middle and squat down. Like, ambiguously biracial, black, maybe woman, hold this sign here. Like, these are actually the people we work with every day. These are actually people who we know a lot about each other, we're friends, we care about each other, we take care of each other. And even though some of these people have never been on a bike, they know everything I'm doing at the Bike Coalition and they support my work. Because we've taken the time to make real partnerships that make sense and that will shape our work. And then I had another social media break, right? Because then I'm thinking, oh, my friends are dope. Let me go online and let me see what they had to say about the debate because my friends are hilarious. And then you're online to do something like that. Let me see my nephew who was just born. I bet they posted a number, another baby picture. Oh, we just did this fun bike ride. Let me see if our album is up yet. But when you're planning while black, as I already mentioned, you try to just take a break, a lightweight break, and you're constantly confronted with the reality of the world that you live in. Where somebody who has their car break down is a bad dude just because he's black. Or a young woman who's riding her bike and gets hit by a car is the one who gets detained put in the back of a cop car, and sprayed with mace. Even though she's only 15, just because she decided to deny treatment. And then you hear, well, you can't deny treatment. But you can deny treatment. There's a ton of folks, when I went to law school at Stanford, there were people who got crazy drunk, did stupid shit in the city of San Francisco, and then denied treatment because we were students and we couldn't afford it. So you'd get yourself in a cab and you'd go wherever you were going and you'd just leave your bike. But if you're black and you have big, beautiful, natural hair and you're intimidating all five feet, 120 pounds of you, you're gonna be detained. So when folks talk about, you know, oh, Tamika, you're at the Bike Coalition. Why do you talk so much about race? Because it is about race. And I think there's so many people who are uncomfortable with that. And there's a ton of reasons why. White supremacy, mainly. <laughs> but everything is about race. Every single thing. And if you are a person who doesn't think that everything is about race, then you are a person with an extreme amount of privilege. And I am so 
so sad for you because it means that you're not doing the best work you can do in your position because you haven't challenged yourself to be outside of your bubble. Do you know how crazy it is to be at a conference like this where everyone comes up to you and is like, oh, Tamika, oh, Tamika, and you're like, that's right, that's right, I'm in the program. This isn't one of the days where I was just one of the three black people they saw today because they were only around planners, right? Like, if you can't be in a space where you are uncomfortable and when you are the only one, then you'll never, never be able to do your best job. And you'll certainly never be able to understand why articles about this incident that talk about the fact that she had a little bit of marijuana on her or that she may have somehow been at fault for what happened with the collision would never happen if she was a 15-year-old white girl with blonde hair and blue eyes. Or you might still be taking your break on social media. You're still scrolling. And then you're like, wait, <laughs> what happened to Sandra? She was just in police custody. How does somebody die in police custody? Spoiler alert, they're black. That's how we die. And I mentioned that my wife was Canadian. And so I remember when this happened, talking to her mom, who grew up in Montreal and Toronto, and she just like, how does this happen? This would never happen in Canada. You just you could just go to prison and then they could just kill you and then they could just say somebody else killed you. And, and the last video of you that everyone shows is of you somehow disobeying so that it's somehow justified that you were killed. And then you try to keep scrolling and you just try to get away from it. All you want is a fucking puppy picture. That's it. And then you see somebody saying that they can't breathe. For what? for taking up public space. The whole point of what everyone in this room does is to make places that people feel happy and healthy and safe. But you can't even be a black man on a sidewalk and feel those things. And maybe you're thinking, but I'm a planner, but I'm an engineer, but I'm an elected official. I, I'm not a police officer. Like, I don't have that problem, but this is all of our problems. Because if the answer to why this happened, or if you want me to believe the answer, is because he was on the sidewalk that he wasn't supposed to be on, then I'm gonna ask you about his neighborhood and where there is green space for him, and when there, where there is open space for him to just be in community. And why, if he was a white man, he would still be breathing. And sometimes you try to think about it and you still don't know. Because you could be doing your job, laying on the ground with your hands up and you can still get shot. And then when you ask why, you're told, I don't know. But I'll tell you who does know, every single black person in America. Because you're black, bro. That's why you got shot. Because that is the reality we face. So maybe there's this idea that our jobs as people who care about transportation is just getting people from point A to B and maybe making it a little pretty on their way. But that's not only our jobs. I hear everyone say safety, 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 but for who? Who's safe in our communities? And when you get in rooms like this and you're used to not hearing voices of folks of color, when you're used to not hearing voices from Muslim folks who are profiled, who can get stabbed just for walking down the street, when those voices aren't in the room, then whose responsibility is it to make sure they feel safe? And sometimes as people of color, we just don't know. We don't know who's looking out for us. And so you're scrolling and you're scrolling and you're just trying to have a good time and you can't do anything but just see countless faces. Faces that could have been your brother, 
your sister, somebody who I grew up with on the military base, who was serving this country, but that didn't matter because she had black skin. Folks just trying to make it. Folks just trying to get from point A to point B, which is what we're all helping with, right? But you just, you get to this point as a person of color in this world where you just shut down. You just throw your hands up and you're like, I don't know what to do. I have no idea what to do. I could get back to work and I could talk about this bike lane or I could talk about Vision Zero or I could talk to the mayor about his transportation plan. But when I leave these meetings in my nice suit, because I know the suit is nice, <laughs> I'm still black. So when my boy Keith and I walk in yesterday and we're both in our fitted caps and he gets stopped before he can come up the escalator unless he can show his badge despite holding a NACTO bag. We don't have the privilege to not think about whether or not it's because we black and because we didn't decide to put on our suit because we flew in and we were tired. Or when I'm at the Hilton this morning and I'm having a great conversation with two of my favorite people from LADOT and we're talking about cake and we're talking about crawling and rolling and babies and then they leave to go to the conference and I go to print something and because I happen to be dressed nicely, someone comes up to me and just starts asking me to do stuff for them. But I don't work at the hotel. And if you've never had that experience, it's because you've had the privilege that when you dress nice, people don't assume you must be there to serve them. I cannot tell you how many times I've been in Target without a red shirt and people come up to me and ask me where the coffee makers are. And I'm just like, I'm in a full suit with a fucking bow tie. Who works at Target and wears this? Like, are you kidding me? Or when you go to the grocery store and the self-checkout isn't working because the self-checkout never works. It never works. And they come over and say, are you having trouble with your food stamps? If you've never had these experiences while just trying to live, then how do you bring it into your work when you're trying to make safe places for people? And if you don't open yourself up to the fact that though you may never have those experiences, someone else is, and you're not talking to them when you're making your decisions, then how will you do your best work? And if all you do is hire a woman or hire a person of color to be your diversity person, but it's not integrated in every department at every level, if you don't have folks who get this on your communications team, on your outreach team, but also in your executive offices, then how are you going to get this right? Because you won't know what it's like to be at Target and be like, oh, I'm about to spend $100 in Target, because how do you not spend $100 in Target? And then just drop all your stuff because the third person has come up to you and asked you for some help. If you don't know that, then how will you understand what it's like for the communities who we all talk about are just so hard to engage? who just aren't showing up, who just don't really care. It's not that. It's that they've just thrown up their hands and given in. And last week when I was a hot mess, it was because I had just given in. I just needed some time. I like didn't check my email for a week because I couldn't go online because I kept seeing images that were traumatizing to me. Because I kept seeing my brother, my dad, my uncle, people who mattered to me who could be there. And so 
I wrote something that a lot of you who are my Facebook friends, because I don't discriminate, I'm Facebook friends with everybody, much to my wife's chagrin. Um, and I wanted to share it with folks who aren't lucky enough to be my Facebook friend. And this is how I was feeling last week as I was trying to plan Wall Black. Sometimes when I get really down, I just write. Not for anyone but me. Not to share, but my wife encouraged me to share this, so I am, because she's the boss. Not to put out in the world, but to get out my feelings and emotions. I write because as a woman of color, we aren't allowed to lose it. We have to keep it together. I'm successful and I'm doing well professionally, and I'm not naive. I know that my ability to make a joke, flash a dimple, and be laid back and chill helps. What if I wasn't into jokes? What if I didn't smile as much and I was angry all the time? Guess what? I am. I just hide it. My parents taught me how. They knew I would need it to survive. But that's why I write. And honestly, I don't write that much because if I write, I let it out. If I write, I admit it. If I write, I cry. If I write, I give in to the feelings. If I write, I have to stop. I have to stop working. I have to stop believing I'm going to be okay. I have to stop pretending I cannot remember all the aggressions and instances of racism I've so neatly packed away. I have to stop being numb to the world I live in, the things that bother me, the things that scare me, the things that will one day kill me. Maybe one day sooner than I thought. Maybe one day before I get to tell my family how much I love them. Maybe one day before I finish a bag of Skittles I'm eating. Maybe one day before I finish the book I'm reading. Maybe one day before I fix my car that died in the middle of the street. My car was in a wreck today, and I wasn't driving. But when I got the call, all I thought about was, thank goodness I wasn't driving. Today could have been my day. And I got this call in the middle of a meeting. I had this panic attack inside. I couldn't focus. I couldn't think. But I finished that meeting. I charmed those people, and it was a success. I was freaking out, but it was a success. And all I could think was, what if today was my day? But that's what we do. We push it aside, and we keep going. I don't write because I feel like I don't have time. I need to make time, but how do you make time when you're constantly on borrowed time? I haven't been able to check my email today. I haven't been able to articulate to my white wife why I want to cry because I'm not sure she'll understand, and I don't want to be upset if she doesn't. I've had a lot of non-black friends text me today and tell me they love me, but I can't. Oppressed people will always need allies. I'm so happy that more people in my life are talking about black lives than Brad and Angelina or how many Kardashians the game slept with. I love you all. Keep fighting. But I can't today. I keep running over and over again in my head. The last time someone called me sir, spoiler alert, every damn day, including today. Today with my baseball cap over my eyes so no one could see my pain and all black on, I watch people watch me. I watch people wonder. I watch people try to figure out what, not who, I'm not a who, just a what, inhabit my body. I'm pretty comfortable with who I am, but when people call me sir, it bugs the shit out of me. And today I realize it doesn't bug me, it scares me. I'm walking through this world, and when I'm dressed and moving in ways that are most authentic and comfortable to me, I am a man, or trans, or both, or neither. It's not how I self-define, but if there's one thing we know as black people in this country, it's not how we define ourselves, it's how they define us. My parents raised me to believe I'm smart, I'm talented, I'm funny, I'm honest, I'm kind, I'm caring, I'm good, I'm flawed, I'm me, I'm perfect. They also raised me to be aware that they, that to, to they, I'm dangerous. Because that is how they define me. As black kids, we're raised to understand early that they have a definition that matters. They have a definition that wins. They have a definition that kills. Even if I'm good. Do you have to teach your kids that? Do you understand the pain in knowing you have to do it, but fearing what happens if you don't? Whether it's white teachers lying to my parents and saying they didn't offer honors classes because they defined me as not smart enough to succeed, or when all black students from my college went on a road trip to a conference and had a group of police officers show up 
when we stopped for gas to arrest us because a concerned citizen defined us as a gang that was there to rob everyone. Or when white administrators not protecting me against my supervisor beating me and sexually abusing me for months when I was just a college kid because they defined me as hypersexual and wanting it. Or a year later defining me as a rapist because a white girl who wanted to date me and I didn't like and said no to and couldn't handle it, they could still only define me as hypersexual and a predator who must have been the one rejected and needed to go to prison as a result. Or when my colleague can't recognize my success is the product of hard work because they define it as me cheating by using my black queerness to get ahead and oppress and threaten them. Or when a cop stops me and defines me as a suspect when I'm being the good friend taking people home or riding a bike that's too nice or driving on Stanford's campus when it's only for students. How I define myself, my friends, and our black joy, pain, hope, our sadness, in those moments is insignificant to them and how they define us. I posted a picture of me with my hands up, don't shoot shirt. And every time I look at that picture, I think of the expression on my face. Partial smirk, partial smile, partial mean mug, partial sadness. I get the mean mug, fuck this shit, I wish you would shoot me. I get the sadness, fuck this, again, who died? Let me get my hashtags ready. But the smirk, the smile, I smirk and smile because I know I'm going to be all right. I smirk and smile because I know no matter how uncomfortable a black man on a knee makes you, Colin Kaepernick is right. I know if the next time someone calls me sir and I turn around with my smirk because they don't see me, they just see their definition of me, I don't know if it's the last time. I think it's this acknowledgement that I'm going to die. And if I go, I don't want there to be fear on my face. I want the smirk. Because when they find out that I'm good, they'll regret it. Right? We're all good. We all have value. We're all people. Maybe it won't matter who I am to them. I'll just be whatever they defined me as before they pulled the trigger. To experience life as black people in this country, to listen to they define us, how can we do all that and not smirk? They don't know us, they fear us. And that fear prevents them from ever knowing, ever asking, or ever feeling anything beyond fear. Every picture, every sunrise, every sunset, it's borrowed time. How can you plan while black when you can't plan because someone else is determining your life for you? But tell me that that ain't they fault. Tell me any of my brothers and sisters facing this ain't here because they systematically segregate us in neighborhoods without healthy food choices and options and transportation. Maybe I'll get hit by a car riding my bike, but tell me they ain't at fault. Tell me any of my brothers and sisters facing traffic tragedies ain't dying because they systematically segregate us in neighborhoods with no sidewalks or infrastructure or concern and don't even talk to us wh about what we need because they're too scared or unskilled to be here. Maybe I'll die fighting the good fight, whatever fight that is, in this nonprofit work. But tell me that ain't they fault. Tell me any of my brothers and sisters aren't out here fighting for the rights of our people, not taking care of ourselves, not making sure we're okay, because they won't fight for us. And if we don't got us, no one has us. Can you tell me that? Maybe not. So you'll like a picture of something that doesn't matter or that feels safe to you. You'll criticize people who agree with you when you say all lives matter or blue lives matter, but you won't do shit about any of these definitions they keep putting on us. Maybe you don't think all lives matter, but you stay silent when your friends of color are hurting. You do it because deep down you don't know what to do. And I understand, I feel that. I don't know what to do either. But I don't have a choice. I just keep getting up. I keep doing things. Living life as a black person in this country, that doesn't feel safe but I do not have a choice. You do. I just keep smirking when I see another day, telling all the folks of color that I love them and hope that when they define me tomorrow, it's not the day their definition finally catches up with me. So I wrote that and a lot of people reached out. And one of the folks who reached out was my sister-in-law who likes everything I post on Facebook, but has never liked anything I ever posted about race. And my wife sent her family an email and said, Tamika shared something today that's really important to me, and I would appreciate if you support her. 
And her sister texted her and said, thank you so much for giving me permission. I never knew what to do. And so this is me giving you permission to go about your work in a different way. We're back to my friend Mark at Facebook. I posted this on Facebook. So maybe you feel like you can't do your work in a different way, but you can pay attention to the people in your life who are struggling and maybe are doing it on social media, maybe doing it in real life. You can just hit the like button. That matters. This is my boy, Justin Bieber. As I said, I love Canada, except Justin Bieber. But his music is so good, especially the song Sorry. Let Justin Bieber be a lesson. It's never too late to say sorry. Now granted, I would prefer that you're actually better at your job so that you don't have to say sorry and that you're actually engaging people first, but it doesn't always happen that way and we all make mistakes. And when we're talking about things like race and power and privilege, we're going to say something wrong. But you can't let your fear of saying something wrong and messing up prevent you from even trying. Because you can always say sorry. The other thing you can do is educate yourself. This is just one of the ways. This is a convening, the untokening conference. It's coming up. And I know there's been a lot of confusion, like is this a space for me? The reality is we want more leaders who are doing this work to be thinking about these conversations. We want more spaces where the folks talking about equity aren't just the women or the people of color. So whether or not it's this convening or whether or not it's going to a group in your community or reading a book, don't just go to the people of color in your life and say, what should I do? Because you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna get on Google and we're gonna make some suggestions. So you can get on Google and you can look some things up you can do and just do them. The other thing you can do is think about when you're in spaces where there are a lot of voices missing and how do you show up in those spaces? So yesterday, I heard somebody on this stage say that Portland was committed to a vision zero with zero profiling. And before that, I heard a lot of things. I heard that a lawsuit in New York had been settled, we all clapped. I heard that like there were dogs involved, we all clapped. But when someone said they were committed to Vision Zero with zero profiling, me and my homie Keith, who I remind you barely got up here, were the two people I heard clap. So you have to really Think, what is it in you that that didn't resonate with you is a big fucking deal. Why didn't you clap for Portland? Because that's huge. And if you don't think about that, then it might be because of privilege what I keep bringing up. Everybody is starting to say, stay woke, stay woke, stay woke. And if you've heard me speak before, you know how I feel about that. As folks of color, as women, we are constantly woke. We don't get to sleep because if we go to sleep, we will die if we are not paying attention. But if you have an opportunity to never think about those things, it is because you have privilege. You have to own that. You don't need to feel bad about it. Don't tell me you're sorry. I don't want your sorry. I know I just talked about Justin Bieber and sorry. But this is one of those things that you don't need to say sorry for. You need to acknowledge it and you need to own it. You need to really understand what equity is and what equality is. And you really need to understand that if we have all these conferences where we're talking about equity, you better know what it means. It's not just a sexy word. It means that the people who have the least get the most because they've been had the least. It's not just distributed equally. And if you don't understand what equity is and you find yourselves in a conversation about equity, be the one who is brave enough to raise your hand and say, I don't know what that means. Can we define that before we move forward? 
And I know that's scary. I know we're all smart people and we all want to know that like we're not that person in that room who doesn't know that thing that our industry is telling us we're all supposed to know. But do something scary. Every time I show up at one of these spaces, I wonder, as a lot of us folks of color say, as Keith has said, if we weren't invited, would we be here? Because this is scary. When you look around and there aren't people who look like you. So if I can do that every day in every space I'm in, then you can raise your hand and say, I don't know what that means. And you have to do it without being fragile. If you got uncomfortable every time I said white person, or if you were offended when I didn't like All Lives Matter, then it's because you're fragile. And I'm sorry. As folks of color, as women, we harden because we know we have to to make it. But if you're in a place where someone is telling you about their experience and then you cry because you think they're calling you a racist, then bye, Felicia. I don't have time for you <laughs> because you are fragile. And I have this conversation with my wife all the time. People are like, is she okay? She's okay because I've had to check her on her white fragility. And I've had to say, if you're upset about this, then you need to go find somebody white to talk about it with, because I'm not the one. I'm your wife, and I love you, but it is not my job to make you feel better when people who matter to you in your life treat me like shit because I'm black. This isn't about you. And if you are in places where you make it about you when it's not about you, then find this slide, Google it, and learn. And just remember that as we do our work, we have to realize that for some people, the way they look, whether it's their skin color, whether it's their gender, maybe it's their gender identity or representation, it makes them dangerous. It makes them a target. And maybe you're not that person, but it is your job when you do your work to think about that person. And if you are still on your journey through privilege and fragility and you're not able to think about those people, then find someone who is and pay them for their services. Thank you.